Hello and welcome to the Sport Walk Show. Yes, this is the first proper edition of the Sport Walk Show and we've got lots lined up for you. In this first extended edition, we've got a preview of our first video challenge route. We get you started with our autumn winter training plan and I'll be going over the different kinds of kit you'll benefit from for different types of walks and challenges. But first, here's a little roundup of what's going on in the world of sport walking. All the major challenge event organisers have now posted their dates for 2021 and, tentatively speaking, there's an exciting schedule building. So here are some of the key dates by organiser. Now there are other events out there that welcome walkers, but quite a few ultras make no mention of whether walkers are welcome or not, so we'll be trying to get some info from these events to build up a picture of all the walker friendly events out there, to give you a complete resource for planning your challenges. At the beginning of November, the Ramblers announced the number of miles of historic paths that have been logged as part of their Don't Lose Your Way campaign, to record all the paths that could be at risk of being lost forever. 49,000 miles of paths have now been logged all over the UK and they're fundraising to support work to ensure these paths can be restored and protected for the future. If you'd like to support this or get involved then you can find out more at the Ramblers website or on their social channels. Last but not least, we've seen growth in membership of our Strava club over the summer, and although numbers are still small compared to other clubs, it's shown that Strava really offers us a great resource for setting challenges and building a highly supportive community around sport walking. In the months ahead, we'll be setting challenges specific to the Strava club, so if you're not on there already, why not download the app on your phone and come and join us. It's free to set up a membership and to get the basic tools you need to track your walks and then you'll be able to take on our exclusive Strava Club challenges. Challenges are central to everything we do as sport walkers. And while the 50 to 100K distance is pretty much standard across organized events, when you start to set up your own personal challenges, your choice of route distance increases exponentially. For me, the marathon distance is quite possibly the perfect sport walking distance because you can complete it easily in anything from six to eight hours, depending on the terrain. But it's rare to get a Waymark trail that is exactly marathon distance. So often you'll have to miss out on completing the whole trail if your objective is to walk a marathon. This is why the Clarendon Way in Wiltshire and Hampshire is such a good route, because it's a testing sport walk in its own right, but it's almost exactly marathon distance. So you can do the Clarendon and do a marathon in one go. This is a magnificent trail that links two really iconic cathedrals in Salisbury and Winchester. It runs over rolling hills and crosses the delightful River Test, as well as passing the unique ruins of Clarendon House in the west and, at the other end, the Farley Mount Monument. The trails are extensively chalk based and are largely track width, although there are some stretches of single track. The environment is mixed with deep woodland and open hilltop with expansive views. As you progress along the route, it keeps rewarding you with something new and the sections ensure that you never get bored. 
In terms of the challenge presented by this route, a sub six hour completion is perfectly viable, although you will be walking hard all the way to achieve that. This is a point to point route, so having someone who can pick you up will be an advantage. But there are good bus and train routes through both cities, so adding public transport to your logistics shouldn't be an issue. You might want to walk it supported, so you can get fresh supplies of fluids and fuel along the way. But equally, it's a distance where you can go fully self-sufficient with drinks and food, if you've got a bladder and soft flasks. When I walked this route in 2018, I did encounter some signage and mapping issues, so you do need to plan your attempt using the downloadable guide and route maps from the Hampshire County Council website to aid navigation. But if you just follow the waymarks on the ground, you won't get lost. This is a route that you can walk all year round because of its length. And, to be honest, you'll find it rewarding whenever you take it on. But in spring or summer, it's quite divine. Hi, I'm Kaz and I'm a health and fitness coach. And this is my story about how I got into sport walking. The weather's coming in. Are we gonna do it? When my kids started school, some school mums and I decided to start a walking group and the walkie talkies was created and we really did talk. Off into the countryside we went chatting and discovering trails that I'd never walked before. I was never the navigator and barely took notice of how we got where we did. I was just pleased to be walking. Whilst in that group in 2016, we decided to take on the Moonwalk, which is a marathon length overnight walk through central London, raising money for a cancer charity. And I was pretty hooked. My friend Laura, who's also a keen sport walker, and a couple of boxer size folks formed a team and we entered the Chiltern 50K challenge. It was close to home and a really nice challenge to do. We could get our teeth into it and it taught us a lot about what we were capable of. I was chatting to my parents one day about the walking and my mum gave me a booklet which contained details of a walk called the Aylesbury Ring. I picked a weekend in July and went for it. Two days of walking in what I thought would be perfect weather. How wrong I was. It pelted it down with rain on day one and I only managed around 40k before lightning stopped play. That left day two to make up the 60k, so quite a, a mean feat. Armed with my standard camelback, some energy bars, a phone and two battery packs, I set off again with hope in my heart and better weather in the sky. After getting off track a bit, because apps can sometimes let you down, and a worrying amount of battery left, I made it. Slightly emotional and very tired, I'd done it. An unsupported 100k and it felt great. Then the Chilton Challenge was back for real in September, so I prepped up, turned up and rocked up at the finishing line in 8 hours 45 minutes, so I shaved 4 hours and 15 minutes off my previous time. It was ace and ended the summer season for me on a really big high. Why do I love it? Well. The sights and sounds of nature is not only beautiful when you're immersed in it, it's also a fantastic healer and brilliant for good mental health. It also seems to exfoliate my mind and takes me right away from technology. And it also presents natural challenges on all sorts of different terrains, so that's always a bonus. It also allows me to enter fun events and therefore receive a wonderful sense of achievement. So, whatever the weather, it gives me a chance to get outside and just generally breathe fresh air every single day. <laughs> Bye. Bye. This is arguably the most important time of the year for sport walkers because it's when you lay down the foundations of next year's challenge successes. If you've got a goal and you want to make sure you reach it, getting into a routine now is vital. Sport walking is an endurance game. It's not about top speed or about being dynamic. It's about being strong, resilient and being able to endure. The more you do it this time of year to prepare yourself, the more enjoyable that act of endurance will be. If you don't do the base work now, chances are that while you may be fit, later on in your challenge, you'll start to suffer. 
Now, if you're sat there thinking, I know I need to get into a training routine, but I just don't know what or how much I should be doing, don't worry because you're not on your own. Getting started with a training program is arguably the hardest part, but once you've got it up and running, it's simply a question of following what you've planned. And although your motivation will dip from time to time, you won't have that added burden of trying to figure out what it is that you're supposed to be doing. That's why we've built this autumn winter training program into the show. So each month, you can update yourself on what to change and how to progress. So let's get down to the plan. And it's really quite easy to start with. This first period is all about building endurance and embedding a routine. It's not a time to be getting too specific about what you're doing. The good thing about the endurance part is that as a sport walker, you don't need to walk really hard aerobically. You just need to be doing the sessions you need to do at a brisk but relatively comfortable pace. It's more about the duration of your work than the intensity or overall speed. So as a rule of thumb, the longer you walk at a fast but steady pace, the better it'll be for your endurance. For each of your weekday sessions, you can just walk briskly as we've shown you in our Move Fast video. Card appears somewhere on screen. Or you can use your own type of walking like Nordic or power or race walking. You can even run if you want to. It really doesn't matter because this is just about embedding structure and making sure that you cover a minimum distance on foot. The plan for this next month then is that you'll go out and do three sessions of at least five kilometers each session during the working week and then one longer session at the weekend. Now don't worry if that doesn't sound like much. We'll be building distance and pace as we go. To start with, you want to walk about 15 to 20 kilometers on your weekend walk because these sessions will have the biggest impact on your muscular endurance. For your weekend sessions, make it a strong sport walk on trails if you can and use it as motivation for your weekday workouts. It's where you put things into practice and these weekend trail walks, while not challenges themselves, give you the opportunity to walk like you're on a challenge and to see how your fitness and strength is progressing. It's also a reward for your work in the week, so try to go somewhere nice and inspiring. Now, as I said before, you can choose how you conduct your weekday sessions, whether you run, walk, it doesn't matter. But at the weekend, make sure that you walk for the whole session. If you're a strong walker already, then try to get closer to 10 kilometers on each of your weekday sessions and a minimum of 20K at the weekend. If you want to, you can split your weekday sessions in two, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. The other thing that's really valuable to introduce at this stage of the year is strength work. Now, I know a lot of people hate doing strength work, particularly with weights, but the impact it can have and the benefit it brings to your walking can be immense. Having stronger legs means you can go faster, or at the very least, feel more comfortable and capable at your normal speed. It also helps prevent injuries, which will become a factor when you aim for longer distances or increase your training load. If you have your sights set on a challenge for next year, you'll really thank yourself when you're on the finish line if you've built strength work into your training routine at this stage. And it doesn't have to be much, just two relatively short sessions, and you can either tag them onto your run or walk sessions or do them on your off days. Focus mainly on your legs, but also work your back, shoulders and core, as these can cause you discomfort on longer challenges as you get tired. It's important to look at all over strength so that you're fully prepared head to toe. The way to build strength with weight is to use the heaviest weight you can manage for each exercise. So for this, look to perform three sets of each of the following moves using a weight that you can lift for eight reps over three sets. Either hold a free weight plate or something heavy against your chest and squat down slowly, keeping your back straight and bum out. Then rise back up again and repeat. Now this exercise needs a barbell or something like it, so it does depend on having some kit or access to free weights. Deadlifts are a full body move and strengthen your legs, back and core. So if you were only ever to do one strength move, this would be it. Lift the bar from the ground and stand up, pulling the bar up to the top of your thigh. Keep the bar close to your shins on the way up. Keep your head up and back straight while you stand up, trying to make the last section from your knees to your thigh a powerful move. You might see people in gyms then drop the bar, but to protect your floor, slowly and with strong control, lower the bar back down to the start point, 
and then repeat. Either use a barbell for a two-handed press or a dumbbell for a single-handed press. Start with your hands and the weight at shoulder level and press skyward to full extension and then return back to the shoulder position and repeat. This is your last exercise and of course, it strengthens your core. Hold the plank for up to a minute, no more, then do up to three sets. As you get stronger, look to toughen the plank with arm or leg movements, rather than just holding it for longer, as this won't have as much impact as changing the move. So there you go, four simple strength moves to get you started. And when you add these to your on-foot training, you'll start to make progress fast. We'll have a training plan update in next month's show, so do send us your pics and videos with a message to let us know how you're getting on. Stumped for ideas on where to go walking this month? Try some of these locations. When you're looking at what gear you need to go sport walking, there are two basic categories, training and challenges. Now we're only looking at equipment today, not clothing or shoes, and within each category you'll have different needs and different options, so let's break things down a bit. For your weekday training walks, where you're just covering distances up to 10 kilometers in a session, you don't really need to take anything with you, unless you're at the very beginning of your journey and you need food or drink to get you through. The only piece of equipment that's worth taking for these sessions is a sports watch or your phone with an app on it to track your walk, so you've got a record of your distance and pace. It's when you go beyond 10 kilometers in training that you start to need some gear and supplies, so the first real level where kit is needed is 10 kilometers to half marathon distance, or let's say 25 kilometers. This is still a relatively short distance, but you will be out for between two and five hours depending on the actual route and terrain, so you'll need to carry some food and drink, a waterproof, and some really basic safety items. Most mountain days would fit into this distance range, but we'll deal with gear for those later. This is the gear you should take if you're walking this sort of distance on relatively benign lowland trails. First up, you'll need a vest or a rucksack with a minimum of five liters capacity. It really doesn't matter what you use for this, as it's essentially just training. But as a part of your training, you do want to try and replicate how you'll function during a challenge. So it is a really good idea to use a vest if you can, and to have pouches on the front straps to carry some fluids and fuel. For distances of up to 25 kilometers, you'll need probably no more than one liter of electrolyte fluid, split over two 500 milliliter soft flasks. Or if it's just 15 kilometers or so, you can probably make do with two 250 mil soft flasks. For fuel, take two high energy bars, something like Chia Charge or another kind of easy to digest bar. You might not need two bars, but it's always better to bring something back than to wish you had more. In the body of your vest or pack, take your lightweight waterproof to give you a bit of protection if it rains. But don't worry too much about being a really robust coat, as you're unlikely to find yourself in a survival situation. The other things you should take for this distance are your mobile, both for communication or maybe to track your walk if you use a phone app for that, a payment card in a small plastic wallet if you're walking somewhere a long way from home, a very basic first aid kit with a few dressings for blisters or cuts, 
several packs of individual antiseptic wipes which are lighter than a tube of cream and a pair of tick tweezers. You can take other items if you want but these would be the bare minimum as a safety net and they won't add massively to the weight you're carrying. I also take one of those small foil blankets you often get in goodie bags from races. They weigh practically nothing and it does give you a little reassurance in case you need to wait for help. Finally, I always carry an empty sandwich bag for, how can I put this, accommodating used wipes should I suddenly find the need to urgently dash into the bushes. There you go, I've said it. When you start to go longer than 25k, the things you should take don't actually change a huge amount from this base point. You just add some more items and increase quantities of fuel and drink. It's not important whether it's a marathon distance or 100k. What you want to take will stay pretty much the same. Firstly, you'll need a bit of a bigger vest. Or if you took the plunge and got yourself a 10 to 15 litre vest the first time around, that'll be fine. You won't need more than a 15 litre volume for a 100k challenge, so you can work with just one vest for all your activities if you want. It's a good idea to add a pair of light, compact over trousers to your waterproofs, so you've got full coverage if you need it and some kind of lightweight fleece or insulating layer if it's possible that you could find yourself going into the night or that it might get cold. Generally, I take a thin skull cap and a couple of buffs, either to use for warmth or to soak in a stream to cool down if it's hot. It's also a very good idea to place any spare clothing in a lightweight dry bag so it's well protected. Food and drink wise, if you're doing a challenge event, there will be opportunities to access water so you just need to take some additional electrolyte tablets or powders to replenish stocks and always go with a minimum of two 500 milliliter soft flasks. If you have a bladder and your vest can accommodate it, the combination of a bladder and soft flask should be enough for about 40 kilometers. But just bear in mind, you'll be carrying more weight so it's a question of whether you want to stop and refill more often or go longer and carry more weight initially. You also want to take some extra supplies in your first aid kit so pack some additional sachets of antiseptic wipes, more plasters and in addition some specialist blister patches. It's also worth taking some hand gel painkillers and diarrhoea tablets but be very wary of taking ibuprofen when you're on a long challenge, especially if it's hot, as ibuprofen can block your body's ability to absorb electrolytes. Some kind of sting relief is another good idea, as is one of those travel sachets of Factor 50 sun cream as a backup. The key upgrade to my emergency safety kit for these distances is to carry a lightweight foil survival bag, replacing the foil blanket I take for shorter walks. I'd also make sure the vest has a whistle built into one of the fittings, as is often the case nowadays, and if not, I'd take a whistle as well. You should take a head torch when you're going on longer challenges, even if you're not planning on going into the night. It's one of those compulsory items for many ultras, and it's better to have one with you than not. If you're going for 100k or more, and definitely going into the night, then you should also take some spare batteries. It's a good idea always to keep all of the batteries separate to the torch, and then just put them in shortly before it gets dark, to minimise the chance of the light switching on accidentally in your pack. Talking of switching things on, if you're going long, it's really important to ensure your devices have enough power, so taking a small power bank is another really good idea. Most sport watches can be charged while recording, so you can top up the battery life and be sure to have the whole route to stick on Strava, but it's really your phone that's the essential thing, especially if you're walking alone. If you're heading into the mountains, regardless of distance, there are some additional safety factors to consider with gear. You'll want to have a vest or pack with a little more capacity, probably around 20 to 25 litres, so you can accommodate more cumbersome waterproofs and emergency supplies. Remember though, this is still sport walking, and we're talking about the kind of walking that's more like fell running than traditional mountain walking, so going with stripped back kit is fine, if you know what you're doing and have some experience in the mountains. If that's not you, then get some knowledge and experience first before you go sport walking in the mountains. When I go in the mountains, I take pretty much everything I'd take for an ultra, but with the addition of full mountain grade waterproofs and a survival shelter. I'd also definitely take a fleece layer and have one of those super compact insulating gilets that packs down really small, but would add some really valuable warmth if I needed it. I'd also take some mountain gloves, spare warm socks and a full wool hat in addition to a skull cap. 
So there you have it, quite a modular setup. But even though some of these things might sound like you're carrying quite a lot, if you buy wisely and seek to minimize pack size and weight whenever you can, you won't find the load a burden to carry. Okay, to finish up, here's your challenge for this month, should you choose to accept it. Can we say that or are we gonna get sued? The Sport Walk Challenge this month fits rather nicely with our earlier piece about the Clarendon Way. It's a midwinter marathon. According to the Royal Museum's Greenwich website, we have seven hours, 49 minutes and 42 seconds to play with if you're aligned to Greenwich Mean Time. So on the closest day you can to Monday the 21st of December, get yourself out early and try and complete a marathon distance while the sun's still up. Or complete it within seven hours and 49 minutes. If you're a fast walker, completing a marathon in the daylight available should be no problem. If you're not yet a fast walker, then this is a great challenge because you've got tantalizingly almost enough time. But if you do go on past sundown, you're not gonna be in the dark for long. You can pick your own route, track your walk, and then post it on Strava titled Sport Walk Midwinter Marathon. And if you're not yet on Strava, get yourself on the app and join our club so that we can all give you kudos. If you're not yet at the stage where a marathon distance is within reach, then aim for a half marathon or even just 10K. Do whatever you can, but try and get out on the shortest day of the year and have a crack at some kind of significant challenge for you. Well, that's all we've got time for this month. I hope you found some useful info and inspiration to carry you through until the next show. Do keep sending us your photos and videos of your favorite places to walk or even just your regular training or walking routes and we'll build them into the next edition. Watch out for previews and info on our Facebook page with what we've got lined up next month. And don't forget to subscribe if you've not done so already. We really want to build a vibrant community of sport walkers around this show. Have a great walking month, everyone, and we'll see you next time. As these sessions will have the biggest impact on your muscular insurance. Insurance? Muscular insurance? I must renew my muscular insurance. Now you don't have to do... And they can either be tagged onto your ro <sighs> cobwebs flying in. I think I've got a spider on my ear. <laughs>